Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, Alex from uh, Caltech giving a talk on holographic toy models with MASHGATE tensor networks. Thanks for uh, being here and presenting this work. Please. Well, thank you for inviting me, Nima. Um, all right. Uh, yeah, as Nima already said, I'm going to talk about uh, um, holographic toy models uh, using tensor networks. Uh, and if you don't know about much get tensor networks, uh, don't worry, I'm going to introduce all of this stuff. Um, so a short overview of uh, this talk. Um, so I'm going to do the, uh, the dutiful introductions uh, that you've probably uh, heard in uh, various instances before about holography and uh, ADS-CFT. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about quantum information and uh, how it pops up in holography in various places. And uh, then I'm going to uh, steer towards uh, the main interest of uh, uh, this talk, which is uh, tensor networks and how tensor networks are related to holography. And after that introduction, I will go through uh, various holographic tensor network constructions uh, that have, uh, exist in the literature, like the mirror, um, the happy code. Um, I'll talk a bit about what kind of boundary states you get out of these models. Um, and that will lead me to uh, the introduction of matched gate tensor networks that uh, I've worked on uh, for a few, few years now, actually. Um, I'm going to tell you how these uh, tensor networks can be used uh, to describe critical scaling CFT-like states. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we construct boundary Hamiltonians for these series uh, and how we go uh, to excited states, uh, how we build holographic codes from that. And at the end, of course, I will give like, a summary and uh, um, a discussion of, uh, of what we found. All right, so uh, basic introduction, of course, the holographic principle. Uh, where did it come from? Well. I think really the starting point is that uh, people um, figured out sometime in the 70s that black holes really are very strange. They behave very strangely. Um, in particular, Bacon, and Hawking uh, made great contributions to this, to this question. And uh, what I mean by strange, well, normal objects that we usually uh, consider in physics have an entropy that scales uh, with the volume of the system. Since uh, the number of microstates um, tends to uh, grow exponentially with the volume. So it takes a logarithm, we end up with a volume. Uh, now, black holes don't do that. Black holes uh, have a peculiar behavior where the entropy, which you can compute, uh, well, which Hawking and Bacon computed, um, the uh, entropy of the black, of a black hole appears to scale with uh, the area of its horizon, um, which, is, uh, which is very odd. And it led people to conjecture that perhaps uh, the information of a, of a black hole is encoded holographically meaning that somehow the number of uh, effective states of a black hole uh, only increases uh, with, with its area and, and not its volume, like a hologram. And uh, shortly thereafter, people speculated that perhaps it's not just a feature uh, of black holes, but perhaps a more general feature of gravity. Um, people were like discussing these general ideas uh, for some time until we found uh, a very specific realization of a holographic duality in the form of ADS-CFT. And uh, since uh, Malasena's discovery in 1998, we know a very, very concrete uh, duality involving gravity uh, that uh, realizes many of these, these holographic features that people were looking uh, for before. And let me go through uh, what exactly this duality implies. So one set of this duality, we have gravity, e plus one dimensions. And then uh, we have this lower dimensional hologram, which is a uh, quantum field theory. Now, there are various uh, constraints on both sides of this duality, and let's go through them one by one. So first of all, this gravitational theory that we're considering is uh, an anti sitter uh, background uh, uh, gravity, meaning that it has a, a global negative curvature. Usually, we consider space times that are asymptotically anti sitter so we can have all kinds of massive perturbations. This is usually abbreviated to ADS. And the QFT side, um, it's not just a generic uh, quantum field theory, but one with conformal symmetry. So we're considering a conformal field theory of CFT. Furthermore, uh, in the coupling regime where we are sure that uh, this duality works, uh, the gravitational theory is weakly coupled. So we can do everything perturbatively uh, with the tools that we know from Einstein gravity. Um, and on the uh, CFT side, uh, we're on the strong coupling regime. So even though um, the quantum field theory lives in a, a lower dimensional space time, this is actually, in almost all cases, a complicated theory that uh, is hard to understand and uh, hard to treat, as it is uh, uh, possible to study it perturbatively. Uh, furthermore, we uh, look at the limit of uh, a small curvature radius alpha, so 
uh, this negative curvature uh, R is weak. And uh, correspondingly, we consider um, conformal field series uh, in the large N limit, where we have a large number of degrees of freedom. Uh, now, if you're familiar with QCD, you might think of N as a number of, of colors in your, in your young Mill theory, for example. And in the original construction, there's also uh, the constraint of the symmetry on both sides. Um, now, in more recent uh, applications of ADS-CFT, supersymmetry has shifted a little bit to the background. I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. Um, but for, this, uh, for these very specific constructions and for these very specific holographic dictionaries um, that we uh, found after this um, um, original discovery by Maldacena, they all rely on supersymmetric formulations. Now, the same year, uh, I think actually the same month that uh, Maldacena's paper came out, uh, Ed Whitten came out with another paper where he, um, in some sense, uh, extended this duality and showed that it uh, indeed is a dynamical duality, meaning that uh, the partition function of uh, this gravitational system can be really equated in this limit uh, with the partition function of a CFT, which means that uh, the dynamics on one side uh, are completely equivalent to the dynamics on the other side. And we can match them. So this is really a very strong, um, um, really strong statement that goes uh, far beyond these uh, initial uh, conjectures of holographic dualities by, by Lenny Susskind and uh, Ed Hoft and others. Um, now to give you a quick uh, geometric picture of ADS-CFT, which is going to become very useful for everything I'm going to uh, do next. Now we, we can uh, we usually represent this uh, this anti-de-sitter space time uh, as a cylinder. So we see that this ADS bulk space time as the interior of the cylinder. Uh, time, the time coordinate in this uh, just two plus one dimensions here, is moving upwards. And for each fixed time, we we have a slice. Um, which uh, we can think of as essentially uh, uh, being like a like a Poincaré disk, like a like one of these like drawings by Escher, where we have an essentially infinite volume compressed into a slice. We see volume getting denser and denser as we move uh, asymptotically towards this boundary. Um, now the the ADS boundary um, is uh, is actually a Minkowski spacetime. It's, it's completely flat, and we essentially think of the CFT uh, as living on this on this, the boundary of the cylinder. So really, uh, the statement of ADS-CFT is that all these gravitational dynamics that happen in this bulk space-time are somehow completely described uh, equivalently by, by a hologram that merely lives on this, on this flat uh, boundary. And of course, a very interesting feature here is that uh, somehow uh, the boundary doesn't have, uh, doesn't have any curvature. Uh, so this, this gravitational, um, this gravitational dynamics seem to be somewhat emergent uh, from these, these boundary um, quantum field theory dynamics. It's just a way you can write the metric and two plus one dimensions. All right, so ADS-CFT, uh, after its uh, discovery, has made uh, numerous connections to fields beyond string theory, where people initially discovered it. Uh, for example, condensed metaphysics, nuclear physics, and mathematical physics. Um, but the connection that I'm particularly interested in, uh, and that I will elaborate on in this talk, is a connection to quantum information, which has been extremely fruitful, and has led to, to a number of uh, really important dis uh, discoveries. Uh, the first one, I think uh, is, uh, uh, that's really been um, uh, really uh, uh, defining for this, for this connection is the holographic description of uh, various entanglement measures, entanglement measures in quantum field theories uh, described uh, through a holographic dual. Um, another huge breakthrough was uh, the realization that you can interpret this ADS-CFT dictionary, so it's a dictionary between bulk and boundary, as a quantum error correcting code. Um, and finally, in, in uh, uh, recent years, uh, ADS-CFT and uh, quantum information ideas have also helped us uh, to uh, construct a possible pathway towards resolving the black hole information paradox. So this is also uh, now been studied with, uh, with tools that are not explicitly holographic, but ADS-CFT has uh, given us a lot of intuition here. And uh, many of these connections um, can also be formulated in models of tensor networks, which I'm going to talk about uh, through most of the rest of this talk. And tensor networks uh, are also uh, very useful at elucidating uh, some of these previous points uh, that I've mentioned, in particular the first two. Uh, third one, uh, not so much yet. Um, so let me elaborate um, these points first before I uh, actually talk about tensor networks to give you some more intuition about this connection. All right, so first of all, let's go into uh, the topic of holographic entanglement entropy, which is the first entanglement measure for which a holographic dual was found. Now, the entanglement entropy is essentially a measure of uh, how 
onto a subsystem of a quantum field theory or a quantum mechanical system is entangled um, uh, with, with the rest of the, of the physical system. And it's uh, formally defined as the um, for Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix. Um, and Liyo Takayanagi found a holographic prescription for it in 2006. So let me give you a, a visual um, explanation of this. So this is again our cylinder representation of the idea of space time. Now we consider a time slice a cut at some constant time, um, which I've uh, drawn here on the right. It's supposed to be our cut. Now on the boundary here, we have our, our CFT uh, state or uh, we, um, some discretization, some, some quantum system, quantum mechanical system. And we take a subsystem, which we call A, and we compute in, uh, its for Neumann entropy in this, uh, of this CFT state. And the Neumann entropy of uh, the reduced density matrix in the state, so basically the information that's accessible to an observer living in A, tells us how much A is entangled uh, with the remainder of the system. Now, this is purely now a boundary quantity. Um, uh, now, this Yutaka Nagi prescription uh, argues that um, instead of computing this as a boundary for a CFT, we can also uh, perform a dual computation that is entirely gravitational in this bulk, uh, which involves computing the area of an extremal surface, which is usually denoted gamma A, so the surface over here, which, because of the hyperbolicity of this geometry in the bulk, um, extends into this, uh, this higher dimension. So it's uh, the, the, the area of this extremal surface is actually smaller than the, uh, than the area or, or length of this, uh, of this boundary subsystem A. <clears throat> and, um, and so the, 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 the prescription is that, uh, that this purely gravitational object uh, tells us something about entanglement on a, on a quantum mechanical system, which I think is a fairly wild statement. Um, I think it took some time for, for the community to actually uh, believe it and uh, find ways to prove it. And this is a very, uh, direct connection between uh, an object that, is, uh, that describes uh, quantum information degrees of freedom uh, to a gravitational object. Um, and it's also clearly very generic. And it has been generalized in various ways. Uh, for example, um, there's a particularly uh, covariant, um, particular covariant uh, formulation of this, which, which the surface is, uh, is really extremal instead of just minimal uh, lying on the slice. OK, so this, I think, uh, it's fair to say, really, uh, Kickstarted the whole connection between quantum information and um, ADS CFT. Uh, so, the next big um, uh, discovery that I already mentioned uh, is holographic quantum error correction. So, let me give you like a, a brief overview of, uh, of the gist of that. So, again, we can, we can consider like a time slice of uh, our ADS space time. We consider some quantum system on the boundary and some, some bulk gravitational system, or at least uh, uh, the uh, gravitational system on this time slice or some other Cauchy slice. Um, now, one of the earliest questions that came up is, uh, well, if you have a subsystem, say a subregion A on the boundary, uh, how much information about the bulk can you really reconstruct? Uh, how many fields, say, living in the bulk can you reconstruct by, by, by having access to a boundary region A? And um, fairly, quickly, fairly quickly, people came up with explicit um, um, reconstruction uh, techniques that essentially tell you that uh, there exists a bulk region uh, called the entanglement wedge, which I've done it here as uh, WA. And everything in this wedge, all the fields in this, uh, that live in here, you can reconstruct by, uh, by, being, by taking information from this boundary subsystem A. Everything that's outside this wedge, you cannot reconstruct. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, that's uh, going from the boundary and uh, trying to relate it to the bulk. Now, uh, what happens if we reverse this direction? So what, uh, what happens if we take, uh, say, fields at some point x in the bulk, and we want to know uh, in which boundary region it is encoded? Now, this question turns out to be much more tricky than the, uh, than the first one, because now we can take, we can take different subregions A or B that, uh, that both uh, have an entanglement wedge that contains this, uh, this point x. So uh, given what I said previously, that means that uh, given both region A and both region B, uh, we can reconstruct uh, uh, the information of the fields at this point x in the bulk. So you say, okay, great. So you have two regions, A and B. They both, uh, uh, they both contain information about phi of x. Um, so naively, you would think that uh, the place where the information is really uh, minimally encoded is the overlap between your boundary region A and your boundary region B, so this region over here. But the problem is, if you compute the wedge of this overlap uh, for certain construction for certain wedges A and B, you will find that the entanglement wedge of this overlap actually does not include x, uh, meaning that uh, phi of x cannot be reconstructed. 
And this, first of all, leads to an apparent paradox. Um, and the resolution of this paradox is that uh, the information is not really encoded in the intersection of A and B, but encoded in both A and B in a redundant fashion. And um, uh, this is usually called um, uh, subsystem duality or subsystem complementarity. Um, and what this really means is that uh, ADS CFT acts as a code, a quantum error correcting code, meaning that the information uh, of uh, pieces of the bulk is encoded on the boundary such that uh, even if we erase some part of the boundary, we can use another part of the boundary to reconstruct what's happened, uh, what's happening in the bulk. So really, there's a certain resilience towards uh, towards erasures on the boundary. Now, this is a completely different perspective uh, of uh, of ADS, ADS CFT. Um, which uh, purely uh, purely comes from this, this quantum information way of looking at it, um, and which clearly uses a very different language uh, from, uh, say, quantum field theory, gravity, or even string theory. And this gives us a completely new perspective of, of trying to understand how ADS CFT works and what really happens there. Um, now, these, I think, are the, 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 really the two uh, main breakthroughs uh, in the connection of um, ADS CFT and quantum information. Um, now, I, I want to try to about uh, tensor networks. So um, how, how does that fit into all of that? Well, tensor networks uh, are often used uh, to describe uh, these, these time, fly, time size constructions as well. And uh, the main idea really is that um, you, you have all these, these continuum objects, which are, which are hard to compute, which uh, rest on some, some conjectural statements. And you want to make things more concrete. You want to build toy models. Um, so really, what you want to do is you want to take this uh, continuous object and have some simple simple discrete model where you somehow discretize this, uh, this bulk space time. Um, and you want to represent uh, your boundary system as a, something like a, like a CFT object to have some, some, some discrete quantum system uh, that lives on this boundary. Now, you've probably seen these pictures uh, in, in various talks. Um, and since uh, I think most of you uh, um, have uh, a have pure string theory background, uh, I thought it would be useful now to actually give you a uh, more in-depth uh, introduction to uh, what tensor networks really are before going into details about how to build these constructions. So you have an intuition about uh, you know, what these models actually are. So I'm giving you uh, uh, essentially four slide uh, primer into um, tensor networks. And then hopefully we can, we can leverage all this intuition to, to build models and to understand how they work. So tensor networks. Um, so first of all, all of these diagrams that I'm showing you are um, what's called a Penrose notation. And what, what, is, what is the main idea here? So um, the main idea is that uh, we have contractions of indices of, of, tensor, of tensorial objects, and we want to represent these as a graph. Um, the simplest example, we have a, a rank four tensor, so a tensor with, uh, with four indices. Now, um, when we say tensor here, we don't, we don't really mean necessarily some covariant or contravariant object that you might be familiar with uh, from GR. Uh, in the context of tensor networks, we usually just consider an object with indices, um, which can be very generic. Uh, so the example is, uh, yeah, just tensor, we write a tensor as like some dot, some squ uh, square, circle, or blob, uh, some, some objects that uh, we use to identify the tensor, and we um, draw each index uh, as, a, as a lag or like as a, as a spike emanating from it. Uh, and if we contract over indices, we write this just by, uh, as a, a connection between these, these legs. For example, if we have a simple uh, product of matrices A, B, C, we can, uh, we can write this product uh, by uh, identifying each matrix as a, a square, square in this example, and just connecting uh, legs where we want to sum over indices. So this is just A times B times C. I've also written here these, these intermediate indices that are being summed over. Uh, usually these are completely omitted in this, uh, in this graphic representation. Okay, so. Matrix products obviously are very easy. I mean, you could just write them down uh, without this notation. So why why do you why do you need this? Why is this uh, useful? Well, if you uh, have more complicated contraction of tensors, uh, you very easily end up with statements or like uh, expressions that uh, become very messy, very nasty. Um, and obviously, it's much easier to have a, a nice uh, graphical way of of constructing these. So, for example, if you wanted to write this down explicitly, where you, you know you have loops of indices and everything. Um, become quite long and messy. But if you uh, write it on graphically, you immediately see uh, the connectivity. And obviously, generally, you have tensor networks, which, uh, which are tensors of different rank. Uh, so things can get pretty complicated. But now, uh, why, why would you want to write down these, these tensors in the first place? Or what's, what's the point? Uh, well, 
there's a very direct and simple connection between tensors and quantum states. If you have an, a rank n tensor, uh, where each, n, uh, each index of this tensor, each, each leg, has a local dimension d. Um, this can be identified with a quantum state on n sites, um, where this dimension corresponds to the local dimension of some site. So I've just written this down in simple first quantized language here. Uh, you just sum over some basis for, for a quantum state, and you identify the amplitudes with each basis, um, which are really complex numbers, uh, with the components of such a tensor T. Now, this is not really a tensor network. This is just a, just one, one tensor. Um, so I still haven't answered <laughs> the question of why you would even want a tensor network. Uh, well, the simple answer is that tensor networks um, reduce the number of parameters that you need to describe a quantum state. Um, so the simplest example that I'm giving you here is a so-called matrix product state, or MPS. Um, if we're just n equal to three. So you take these building blocks, which are tensors with three legs. Um, and two of these legs I denoted as a j with some subscript, uh, one index as k. Now k uh, is supposed to be the physical uh, index, which we later identify with a, a physical uh, um, a basis of a quantum state. And so we take uh, n of these tensors, uh, we contract uh, neighboring pairs of these j's together, here with periodic boundary conditions. Um, as a result, we get a, get a contracted tensor, uh, which, which only has remaining indices, which we identify with a physical basis. So now for this example, you don't actually uh, reduce your parameter space because you, you start with three uh, index tensors and you end up with three index tensors. But of course, if uh, we choose any arbitrarily large n, the number of components in this tensor T will grow exponentially. Uh, whereas here, uh, we still have a finite number of parameters. So really what we want to do with tensor networks is we we have a high dimensional Hilbert space and we want to describe it with fewer parameters. Um, now, imagine uh, we, have a, we have a tensor network and we want to use it as an ansatz class. So we want to use it to describe a certain quantum state. Now, what can we actually do with this tensor network? What kind of screws can we turn um, to, to modify our, our state? Uh, and there are basically two, two things that we can do. The first one is we can, uh, we can play around with the network geometry. So we can, we can choose a certain uh, connectivity of our tensors. Now, what does that give us? Well, uh, one can show that um, if you take, uh, um, say, a bipartition of your system into a system A and its complement uh, AC, um, then this network uh, essentially tells you about how much entanglement you can have between A and AC. In particular, if you make a cut through, through this network, through the tensor network, um, then this cut gives you a bound on the entanglement entropy. And this bound is just given um, uh, by the number of cuts, the number of legs that you cut, times uh, the bond dimension. I, so I'm not about the log of the bond dimension at each cut. So the, the number of uh, uh, essentially values that uh, you sum over at each cut. Now for simplicity, I'm assuming that each, each bond uh, has the same bond dimension. Um, and now this is true for any cut. So this, this bound holds for any cut. So obviously it is strongest for the minimal cut. So the cut through this network uh, with a minimal number of uh, legs that it, uh, that it passes, um, which uh, leads to the statement that the minimal cut uh, gives you the maximal entanglement of your, of your quantum state on the boundary. In other words, if you know uh, the entanglement structure of your quantum state that you want to describe, you can um, build a tensor network with a, uh, the network geometry that uh, allows uh, for exactly uh, that um, amount of entanglement and not more. All right, so this, this is the network geometry. That's, that's the first screw that we can turn. Now the second screw is exactly this, this bond dimension, um, which we uh, up to now uh, can choose freely. And uh, well, clearly, as we can already see here, um, oh, where are we? Um, as we increase the, uh, the bond dimension, we, we, we allow for more entanglement. Um, but what does this really mean? What does this give us? And the intuition here is the following. So, so why, why, why is this useful? Why, why does this bond dimension a good parameter? And why, why don't we? Why, do, why doesn't it need to be infinity to, uh, to describe uh, physical uh, quantum states? And the main intuition behind this is the following. So if, if you just take a generic uh, n-qubit or n-qubit Hilbert space, um, you will actually find that for most, most states that live in this Hilbert space, um, the states uh, obey uh, what's called a volume law of entanglement. It means that the entanglement entropy of, um, uh, of our subsystems of that state will scale uh, with, the, with the size of the subsystem, with the volume of the subsystem. Um, now, while this is a generic feature of states in a, in a generic Hilbert space, um, there, of course, exists a subspace um, 
were, um, were actually very small subspace, um, whereas the entanglement uh, scales uh, with the area. But this subspace is actually the space of, of most physical states that we, we care about, um, most applications. So for example, um, mo most ground states of local Hamiltonian lie in the small subspace of the full Hilbert space that we could, uh, we could in principle uh, describe, which means that if we uh, want to describe physics um, in, this, in, this, in this physical subspace, um, we don't really need a description of states that live in this, in this giant volume law Hilbert space. It's sufficient to have a description of states that live in the smaller subspace. Um, this physical corner of the Hilbert space is sometimes called. And in fact, we can probe this smaller subspace exactly using tensor networks uh, by increasing the bond dimension. So we start with a small bond dimension. We obviously only uh, probe a very small number of states. Uh, for, for chi equal to one, it's, it's just a single state. And as we increase it, uh, we gradually um, we gradually pass through this with this area law subspace uh, for, for suitable tensor network construction, and gradually we are able to to describe more and more of this, this physical Hilbert space. So there's a there's a reasonable uh, physical argument to be made as, it, as we increase the bond dimension, um, we, uh, we, we we gradually um, uh, approach um, uh, a potentially exact description of of, of physical uh, quantum states that we uh, care about for realistic Hamiltonians. All right, maybe I should ask at this point, uh, are there any questions? Um, I have a question. So I think this is a basic question, but um, so this bond dimension, is this only applicable in this small subspace? If you, ah. if you go outside the small subspace like for the volume law uh, space. Right. Yeah. So, so, actually, so actually, so the thing is, so um, if you increase the bond dimension, what happens is that uh, at some point you will, you will hit the limit of uh, you know, the, the, the area law states, mm -hmm. and you will actually be able to describe in principle all states. So the thing is, if you, for, for a tensor network, usually if you make the bond dimension infinite, uh, at mm -hmm. some point, the size of your tensor network ansatz will be larger than the, um, <laughs> the size of your Hilbert space that you're describing. So uh, at some point, you're basically describe, able to describe anything, but uh, your tensor network is not really useful ansatz anymore because it has more parameters uh, than, your, than your Hilbert space. Um, so um, really, uh, there's only a, a small subspace uh, where your tensor network is like still, still useful, where your bond dimension does not uh, scale exponentially um, uh, with, the, with the physical system that you're looking at. I see, I see. OK, thank you. Yeah, no worries. So that's a, that was a really good question. Um, okay, if there are no more questions, um, I, will, I think I will give you some specific examples um, just to make this tensor network construction more explicit. Um, so why, there's three classes of widely used tensor networks um, I'm going to show you. Uh, the first one you already saw is matrix product states, um, which are very, very useful for one dimension systems. So these are um, the set. Um, just uh, tensors uh, in a chain. Sometimes these are also called tensor trains, um, where the number of tensors uh, uh, is exactly the number of uh, physical sites of your quantum system. And it's actually been shown quite rigorously that uh, matrix product states can very efficiently classify um, one-dimensional or one-plus-one-dimensional uh, quantum systems um, with uh, gapped phases, meaning uh, that they have uh, an energy gap, so they're not non-critical systems. And uh, one can show that this is directly related to the appearance of an area law. Now one can very naively um, extend this to higher dimensions. Now for two dimensions and more, uh, these are usually called projected entangled pair states uh, for technical reasons. And this is just a very straightforward generalization of an MPS. Uh, you now want to describe a two-dimensional system. And again, you identify each, each side with a tensor and uh, you contract uh, these tensors with the neighbors in, uh, in a grid architecture. And I think you can very straightforwardly see that uh, uh, these tensor networks will also give you an area law because if you take, say, a subsystem of some sites, then the minimal cut uh, through your tensor network uh, is just going to be a cut along the boundary of this of the subsystem. Um, so even though we don't have uh, many rigorous statements for PEPs as we have for MPS, uh, these have been extremely useful in lots of numerical studies to study uh, 2D uh, area law phases, which are essentially also, also gapped systems. Um, so not, not critical systems where um, uh, the correlation links diverges. Um, and uh, the third example uh, is actually a tensor network you would just use for critical systems, um, which is a multi-scale entanglement renormalization ansatz, or MERA, 
um, which is very effective at describing uh, one dimensional, one plus one dimensional critical phases. So phases where the, uh, the energy gap uh, vanishes, the system becomes gapless. Um, now these, uh, these systems, we usually have an entanglement entropy that scales uh, with the logarithm of the size of the system. Uh, so sometimes it's somewhere between an area and a volume law. Uh, this, this behavior also has uh, generalizations in higher dimensions. Um, and now the, the MERA tensor network has a very uh, peculiar structure. Now the physical sides are supposed to live uh, at, the, at the bottom of this, of this network. You can immediately see that we have, we have more tensors um, than we have um, physical sides. In particular for N sides, we have something like uh, N log N um, tensors. And these tensors form a sort of a tree-like structure, uh, which, which branches off uh, um, uh, to the top, uh, towards the top here. Um, and what this Mara tensor network really, really does is uh, it represents uh, something that uh, people have started calling entanglement renormalization. And essentially, so it, each, each slice, each layer of this, this, this tensor network you can think of as representing uh, some scale of your system. Since at critical points, we essentially have uh, scale invariance. Uh, we essentially did a physical description of physics at every scale, uh, every length scale of your system. This is uh, how this mirror network geometry comes about. And if you uh, take a subsystem of this, of this boundary and you uh, look at the geometrical minimal cut, you will find that it exactly uh, reproduces this, uh, this logarithmic scaling. Um, there's also something in this, this drawing of the mirror tensor network uh, that uh, is generic to a tensor network that we can see here very nicely, which is that if we uh, cut off uh, the tensor network at some layer here at the top, uh, what we really have is not just a description of the state, but really a description of a map, um, a map between quantum states. And in this case, a map between states at um, some smaller length scale to a map on some, uh, some, uh, or some sorry, on some, some, co some coarse grained uh, length scale to uh, some fine grained length scale. And this map uh, is in fact an isometric map features uh, these tensors according to this, uh, this mirror prescriptions where they're essentially unitaries. Okay, so those are the three examples I wanted to give you. I, I hope you have, you have some intuition of uh, how tensor networks work uh, uh, now. Um, but now let's, uh, let's go back to what, what we actually wanted to do with tensor networks, which is holography. So I'm going back to the slide, which I showed you previously, which was uh, that we have, we have a time slice of, uh, um, uh, for ADS spacetime, and we want to describe it by, uh, by a discrete tensor network. Um, as I said, the geometry is supposed to be discretized. Uh, the boundary regions, uh, subsystems are now uh, subsystems of tensor indices. Uh, but that's immediately raises the question, which kind of tensor network, which class of tensor networks uh, should we use to do this? Like, where, where does this actually make sense? Because obviously not every tensor network, not every tensor network has properties that uh, uh, deserve to be called holographic. Um, so candidate one is exactly the tensor network that I was uh, already talking to you about earlier, which is the more discrete entanglement renormalization ansatz, the mirror. And the mirror has some properties that uh, make it quite um, appealing um, uh, as, a, as a holographic toy model because uh, it produces conformal field theory like states, it produces critical states. You can uh, take something like a continuum limit where it appears that uh, you really get continuum uh, CFTs. Um, the states that you produce have a polynomial decay of correlations, which uh, of course is very characteristic of CFTs. You find logarithmic entanglement entropy scaling, as I already said. Um, so it really seems that you get something CFT-like on the boundary. So the states produced by this ansatz are clearly uh, very uh, uh, holography-like. However, there are also some disadvantages. Um, the first being that uh, this, this bulk geometry that you get this tree geometry, um, doesn't really match what you would expect of a geometry of, of a slice um, as well. There are some ideas that it, you might think of it as some sort of uh, discretized light cone. Um, but clearly this raises the question of how you identify these tensors with, with bulk degrees of freedom. So it's not really clear uh, whether where, where gravity in, in, AD, in ADS really, really appears in mirror. Um, another problem is, as I also mentioned previously, ADS CFT is a quantum error correcting code. And the mirror does have some features of quantum error correction, but uh, these are only approximate. And it's not clear how we would really uh, find a limit where we reproduce the, uh, the exact uh, holographic properties uh, of, uh, of quantum error correction. Good question, sorry. Um, yes. There, there's something that I've always been confused about, which is I understand the connection between the MERA and uh, why it's a natural candidate for uh, one dimensional, one plus one D CFTs because of the log term in the time entropy. 
Right, right. If I go, if I go to two plus one dimensions, yes. Why, why should I? You know, what is the argument as why that Mera is a good candidate? Given that even in two dimensions, Mera is actually kind of peps. It's a special case of peps. It's a special case of peps. No, not yeah, quite. I mean, I'm, I'm asking this. Oh, but I mean, in, in higher dimensions, what you do is, I mean, the, the mirror is, uh, is it's, 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 this is like a slice through like a high dimensional mirror in higher dimensions. So what you, what you do for then is uh, that you have, you still have a tree, but it's like, it's like a, uh, it's like a 3D tree. It's like a, uh, so you, you, well, you, in mirror, you always have one more dimension than your physical system. So for, if you want to describe like a, a two dimensional system, so a two dimensional spatial system, um, what you do is you have a, you have a two dimensional, um, two-dimensional grid of sides, for example. And from this uh, two-dimensional grid, you start growing a tree in, in, in the longer third dimension. So maybe, um, maybe I can ask my question differently. If I, in, in the two plus one dimensional example of Mira, hmm? what, do I, what scaling do I expect for entanglement entropy of a ball-shaped region? Um, I think you, like at least uh, heuristically, you do get the right scaling. I think you, you do get, uh, so it's, it's not logarithmic anymore, but it's, it's, it's some power, I think. Um, I mean, it, we expect it to be parallel, right? That's, right, right. No, I, I think that, there's a distinction between even and odd dimensions, which I'm not quite sure how to see that in Mira. Even in odd dimensions. Yeah, so actually, so the Mira, it's a bit, it's a bit more tricky also to construct in higher dimensions because uh, Essentially, you need to uh, you need to have like um, like several layers of, of interconnecting connecting uh, tensors. I see. But uh, I mean, there have been some numerics that people have actually uh, been doing this. It's uh, it's not very efficient because you just need a lot of tensors. Um, but I think at least at least from the ge from the geometrical structure that you should be able to use it. Um, yeah. To uh, describe high, uh, high dimensional critical states, it's just it's actually numerically uh, also not that easy to use the mirror in higher dimensions. It's it's, it's a very tricky ansatz. I see. So just, just more, uh, also a little side comment. Right? So we actually looked at this problem of how to go from Kim Castoriano to holography. Mm -hmm. And we, we wrote a paper about this. We discussed some of the stuff over there, but we can discuss this offline. Oh, interesting. I mean, I mean, uh, this example, I mean, what they really were looking at was like quantum error correction of these, on these boundary states of that level. So um, yeah, sometimes this is like a, uh, this is also like a, like, like a part of what people are interested in when they talk about quantum error correction and ADS CFT, because you're also interested in, by quantities essentially. Uh, anyways, um, yeah. Um, so this is this is candidate number one. Uh, <laughs> um, so candidate number two that you've probably uh, also heard of uh, is the holographic pentagon code, uh, which uh, maybe more famously known as a happy code, um, which is of course an acronym of uh, its inventors, uh, Vastavsky, Yoshida, Harlow, and Presko. Uh, you just have to rearrange their names alphabetically and then you get happy. Um, if you allow uh, uh, Dan Harlow to have to, uh, to get two letters. Um, and now the uh, holographic pentagon code is constructed as a tensor network uh, with, uh, with bulk legs. So these are, these, are, these are legs over here, these, these black lines. And these red dots are also legs that are uh, sticking out of the plane. Um, so let me explain to you what the happy code actually is, get, give you like a brief review. Well, first of all, the, uh, the letters that you see here is a um, regular hyperbolic tiling. For this uh, uh, canonical pentagon example, uh, it's a pentagon tiling. So we have pentagons here, and you put four of them on each corner. So you get uh, this is denoted in this Schläfli notation as a four, uh, five four tiling. Um, so you arrange your tensors in this tiling, you connect them along the edges. Um, now each each of these pentagons uh, actually has has six legs. There's five uh, in this plane and one sticking out. And the tensor that you choose in this tensor network is uh, the tensor that represents the um, uh, encoding isometry of a particular type of quantum error correcting code called the 513 code. Now it's a code that uh, uh, encodes uh, five uh, on five physical sides, which are these, uh, uh, these black uh, connections here for each tensor. Um, and it encodes on these five sides uh, one, one logical qubit. So one, uh, one, you might think of this as one spin, for example, one spin degree of freedom that uh, is identified with this leg that's sticking out of this plane. So it's like a map from from this uh, from this red dot to these uh, to these uh, black lines to these black indices. Um, now, what happens uh, when you choose uh, these tensors uh, according to this encoding isometry? Oh, by the way, the three just means the, uh, the code distance for the number of 
Pauli type errors that you need to get from one uh, encoded state to, to another. And so what, what happens if you choose a tensor? Well, um, you get a very particular type of tensor called a perfect tensor. And what are perfect tensors? Well, you know, I've, I've taken one of these pentagons and essentially stretched it out. So the red dot is now like a, a leg sticking out. Um, and the property of these perfect tensors is that if you, if you do any, take any bipartition of your, of, your, of your legs, of your indices, uh, you will find that they are always maximally entangled. So the, system, the quantum system defined on these legs is always maximally entangled among each bipartition. Um, and this uh, property uh, is also called um, uh, absolutely maximally entangled. And so the states that you get from these tensors are absolutely maximally entangled states. Um, and as I said, each tensor is a, um, you can think of as a, as a map from um, some logical um, uh, qubits that you want to encode uh, to, to these uh, five physical sites on which you want to encode them. And if you put this all together in one giant tensor network, what you get is a bulk boundary map of quantum information. So each, uh, each, physic each logical qubit living on one of these, these red dots um, is uh, the results are all mapped uh, to some physical degrees of freedom that live at the asymptotic boundary of this, uh, of this tiling where we have, uh, at some point we think of, usually think of cutting it off and then we have some, some physical sites that are open and this defines us a map. And one can actually show that due to the, both the, tensor, the perfect tensor property and this hyperbolic lattice geometry, uh, this map uh, is an isometry. So it's, uh, so you can, you can you can go both ways essentially. Um, Question? Yes? Can you, can you go to the next, oh, okay, the, the previous slide maybe. The one before this, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, this one. So, um, uh, the so the map from A to B is an isometry for any splitting of the legs, right? Is that that's the definition? What is meant here by um, absolutely maximally entangled? What, what does it mean? Uh -huh. A and B are maximally entangled. Yeah. Well, it's basically just uh, the same that I just said. So absolutely maximally entangled means that uh, for any for any bipartition, uh, the entanglement is maximal, meaning that it is uh, um, essentially uh, it scales with the, with the number of sides of the smaller system. But sorry, bipartition. So you have one leg sticking out, which means that you have a density matrix on A B. Is that right? Ah, so technically, so there, there, there are two ways. I mean, you can include the bike leg as well. So the, the nice thing about, uh, so the, the reason why, so this thing has, uh, if you include the bulk leg, it is an even number of legs. Yes. Um, the nice thing is, so even, so even if you include that bulk leg, this thing is a perfect tensor. That's, uh, that's the original construction. Um, but if you contract it out, say if you put like uh, some, some state onto this, if you project onto it, um, the state on the remaining indices, number of indices will also be a perfect, uh, perfect tensor. Uh, because any bipartition that you have is, can now maximally be a bipartition with, uh, well, yeah, it's like three sides and one uh, in A and uh, two sides in B. So the um, so this, what it now means to be uh, to be uh, maximally entangling means uh, is, is to have uh, entanglement which uh, scales like uh, like two times the one dimension of these of these legs. I see. Um, I see. So the yeah the the uh, sort of the the upper bound is saturated. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like the, the maximum entanglement that you can have between both both subsystems you you, you find. And this is, yeah, this is true whether you include the bulk leg or not. Um, but yeah, what you usually think of having like is like a state created by some 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 bulk input. So that's why I've I've taken the uh, the bulk leg uh, separately here. I'm just I'm just wondering. If this is probably off topic, but I'm just wondering if there is some sort of a notion similar coming from this like perfect tensors that could lead to specific class of states that multi-parted states that one can call like maximal entanglement because the issue of what is a maximal entangled multi-parted state is not a easy there's no there's no easy answer to that question right there is no yes yes it's actually that's like a classification of, uh, of these ame states for um for small n for a small number of uh, of, of, quantum, of of sites for, for uh, mm -hmm. both qubits and and qdits there's some no-go theorems um and there are also weakenings of this property. For example, there are, uh, uh, there are these planar maximally entangled states where you only consider bipartitions that are connected. So not the one on the bottom, for example, where A and B are, con are composed of these disconnected systems. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Yeah, no, no, no worries. Um, that's a good question. Um, um, I have, sorry, I have a question. Yes. So 513 code is the perfect code, which saturates the trade-off bound. Um, 
Right. So the trade-off bound is like n. So n is the whole total Hilbert space. K is the mm -hmm. um, degrees of freedom logical, and then d is the call distance. So right, right. if you have three parameters, uh, trade-off bound uh, tells you that n minus k is greater than or equal to two times d minus one. Right. Exactly. So, it's like sort of an, it's a very optimal code. It essentially, you use right. the entire Hilbert space that has available. Uh, right. Completely. So my question is, if you construct um, code with a tensor network, like the perfect code that saturates straight off bound with a tensor mm -hmm. network, do you always expect to have um, perfect tensors like this or? Um, no, not, not every. Okay, okay. I mean, not, not every code. So the, the, the 5 on 3 consists of a very symmetric spot in the, in the uh, in sort of the, the family of, of quantum error correcting codes that you can have. Mm. Um, now, the problem is that uh, there, there, there exist these bounds. Um, so, so you, can, you can always, so the other direction works. You can always, you can always define, if you have a perfect tensor, you can always define a code from it. Um, mm. I but it's not necessary. The question of whether it's a good code is sometimes, sometimes a bit tricky. Um, I see. So um, is, it, is it correct that uh, all these uh, perfect tensors for various dimensions, they saturate the uh, bound? Um, yeah, which, which bound? Uh, you mean the, 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 the code bound? Sorry? Ah, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so they, they you you intuitively mm -hmm. would think that you know five one three is very special, and so would be uh, all the other perfect codes, right? Uh, perfect tensors. So you would think that maybe maybe this means that all these perfect tensors are max is, are using maximal amount of Hilbert space that's available to them to optimally. Um, in code, but I, I don't know. This just right, but awesome. but it's it's a bit more complicated, right? Because I mean, you, you usually I mean, this, this assumes sort of a very specific uh, I mean error model, just like this this, this Pauli error model, where you have uh, where you think of your your errors being like uh, essentially Pauli x, y, and z operators uh, acting on your system. Um, so I'm not entirely sure if this. Uh, I think for high dimensional codes, it's it's, it's a bit more tricky mm. to, find, to find the optimal codes. Um, well, I, actually, I, mean, I didn't mean that higher demand. Well, I meant so, so there, there are two issues. Like we usually write like this, uh, you know, uh, five one three q for example. That q would be two, right? We're talking about qubits, right? Right. So, so, so the problem is, so if you look at it from the perspective of erasure codes, then these perfect tensors in some case, in some way, in some sense, give you the optimal code because it sort of maximizes um, um, the distribution of your information. So it's uh, if you think about how many qubits you can erase um, uh, and, and still preserve your logical qubit, uh, then I would say that the perfect tensor always gives you sort of the, uh, like an optimal, uh, an optimal, yeah, that's, that's an optimal code. Well, yeah, yeah. But I think if you if you go beyond erasure codes, it, it's a, it's a bit more complicated. Um, For sure. Okay. Okay. I see. Thank you. I think I think that would be the upshot. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. No worries. Um, Okay, so yeah, so <laughs> I mean, here you only really have like a, this very specific uh, uh, construction using this five on three code. Um, but these are the perfect tensors here are the more um, uh, the more uh, essential property. Um, and these generalizations of the happy code are based on this idea of using perfect tensors. The fact that it, uh, if you get this nice code here is uh, it's just a very nice uh, coincidence for this uh, um, for the pentagon case. Okay, so what, what I was saying is so, so this construction gives us a really nice map from back to boundary. Information as I said it is symmetric, and uh, now it's uh, a crucial point that makes it uh, so nice is that it reproduces subsystem duality uh, that I previously mentioned in the continuum, which is that uh, you take a subsystem, uh, you can associate with the subsystem some some wedge, which is now called the greedy wedge, which you get from something called the greedy algorithm, and all the uh, the logical information or the logical qubits in that wedge you can reconstruct from information on the, on the boundary subsystem. But now, if you take two, two subsystems, uh, you again have this, uh, the same phenomena that we saw earlier, the parent paradox. You can have two regions A and B that are both sufficient to uh, reconstructing uh, a logical qubit, say, on this point uh, here, on this pentagon, at the bulk. But if you take the overlap between A and B, uh, 
Then you get a wedge, uh, which you can't even really see here, which is much smaller, uh, which does not contain um, this logical qubit. So uh, you, you clearly see here this, uh, this idea of resilience to erasure that you can take, uh, say, the overlap uh, and uh, your A system to reconstruct this uh, qubit over here, or you can take the overlap and the B system to reconstruct it. Um, so there's a redundancy of information, which is exactly what uh, we talked about earlier in the continuum. But now we have a discrete model um, to actually uh, to actually realize it. And then we can, so for example, implement on a computer. Um, now that, let's look a bit more uh, closely at what uh, this heavy prescription, which is really like a tensor network uh, built to reproduce the uh, quantum error correct properties of ADS CFT. What this really implies for the physical states that we get. So again, as I said, uh, the description is we take perfect tensors, we put them on a regular hyperbolic tiling. Um, now the natural question is to ask, does this produce boundary states that look like those of, say, the mirror ansatz? Do we get something that looks like a, like a CFT? Um, and first of all, the entanglement entropy scaling, we can compute from this perfect tensor property fairly straightforwardly. Um, it's again logarithmic, so that's, that's nice. That's exactly what you would expect. Um, but the correlation functions are now very weird. Because of this uh, high degree of quantum error correction, the correlation functions are now very highly constrained. And if you just uh, think of uh, simple spin-spin correlators, um, these are usually zero. So single spin uh, side to single spin side, uh, say Pauli x here, Pauli x there will, will be uh, will be zero, and you can uh, directly derive this from this uh, from this ability to reconstruct errors. So basically, simple correlators could correspond to errors that are correctable in this code. And so, if, if the correlation function were non-zero, you would learn something about the code, which which violates uh, this correct correctability uh, condition. However, actually, if you take this uh, this model and you map it from spins to fermions. You can see that there actually exist very sparse uh, Majorana-like correlators that do give you non-zero expectation value. Um, so, um, I wrote a paper on this with uh, collaborators a few years ago where we go through these so Majorana dimer uh, structures that you find in these sort of, uh, these codes. Um, and uh, if you only look at these uh, these dimer-like non-zero correlators, you actually find that these do decay polynomially with boundary distance. So there is some of some some sort of remnant of uh, of CFT-like correlation decay, even in these uh, in these happy codes, but in some sense these uh, these, these non-zero correlators are related to uh, uh, certain certain failures of, uh, of quantum error corrections that uh, appear to uh, some geometrical properties of this code. Um, now there's another observation uh, that we find, um, which is that uh, if we take uh, this code and we project uh, our bulk qubits into a logical basis state. So the logical basis states are the states that span our logical qubit. And we usually uh, denote them with this, uh, with this bar over our zero and one. So this is our logical zero and logical one. Um, well, yeah, so if we, if we do this projection of logical basis states, so if we project out uh, the state onto uh, each, of these, each of these red dots, um, then uh, the state on the remaining uh, five physical qubits actually becomes a, a Gaussian state, a fermionic Gaussian state, under this, uh, this this spin to fermion uh, Jordan Wigner map, um, and that, I mean that's a very curious observation. Um, and uh, now, now these Gaussian states are essentially free fermion states, uh, and that allows us uh, to do something, uh, which is to uh, to build these tensor networks in a language uh, of uh, free fermionic states. Um, and well, the question is, can we actually make use of this property to uh, to generalize? Beyond models like the happy code to, to build better models of holography. Um, uh, and uh, crucially, can we do this efficiently? Um, the answer turns out to be yes. This is where uh, match scale tensors come in, which are now uh, uh, the main, the main uh, feature of this talk. And um, I want to introduce this. Uh, hey, can, I, can I ask a quick question? I'm a little conceptually confused about what you uh, said in the previous slide. So. Yes. Um, the Jordan Wigner transform from spin to fermion is that is that the transformation you were, you were doing from qubits to uh, fermions, right? Exactly. So, but that's that's highly non-local, right? So this structure of the qubits that were sitting on a graph, written in terms of the fermion, is going to be a mess, right? Because the generally, generally yes. So, so you are, you are, your Pauli x and y operators are basically mapped to to strings of my one operators. Yes. Yes. Um, so if you're referring to this question over here with the decay of correlations, so actually these Majorana-like operators, you can also relate to spin operators that are also local, 
but they're no longer one side operators. So you can, um, you can have, you can have uh, pairs of operators where these Majorana, where these Majorana spins, uh, um, where these, these chains of Majorana operators cancel out. And you just have a local operator here and a local operator there. Okay, maybe, maybe I should look at the, this in more detail. Okay, thank you. Okay, but you're right. Generally, generally, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, this is a very non-local map. Um, but there, there's, uh, there's some operators that are still local in, in, in both pictures. Um, okay, so um, so so then also another idea is can we can we use um, this is fermionic language, this is fermionic Gaussian state machinery to do things uh, things more efficiently and look at uh, more generic uh, models. Um, first of all, let me let me tell you what I mean by by magic tensor. Um, so as I said, uh, we have tensors are really just amplitude of the quantum state. And we say that this tensor fulfills the match gate constraint if uh, the state can be written in terms of uh, uh, fermionic Gaussian state, which basically means that we can write it in as a, a, a quadratic expansion um, in, uh, in correlators. So what, what, this, what this means is that, uh, so this is a very, very technical uh, definition. So what this means is that if you, if you write, uh, write a state in this form, is that, uh, by the way, this is a canonical vacuum. So what this means is that uh, you have a state that is completely determined by its, its two-point functions, which we usually write as capital gammas. Um, and uh, if, you, if you know your Q of T, I mean, this will be familiar to you um, from the idea of, uh, of Wick's theorem for, for non-interacting series. Because um, if you want to know, say, the four or six-point function of a, of a free theory, what you just do is uh, you uh, take all possible uh, uh, two-point functions, uh, all possible uh, contractions uh, um, in in Wick uh, theorem language, and uh, sum over all of them. That gives you your your higher point uh, correlator. Um, now th this property uh, that uh, yeah, your your Gaussian your Gaussian sets essentially no longer have an exponential number of degrees of freedom, but a quadratic number of degrees of freedom, which are your your two point correlation functions, allows them to be very efficiently uh, characterized and very efficiently contracted. So tensors that correspond to these uh, these three fermionic states can be contracted in an effort that scales only polynomially in the system size. Um, that makes it uh, very very uh, easy to contract even tensor networks with, with hundreds of indices, uh, which otherwise we would uh, probably need a computer a supercomputer uh, to to handle. So it becomes very easy to really build large tensor networks and to um, really go through uh, a large set of parameters uh, efficiently. And this is, of course, a very nice feature that we will want to uh, use just, to um, build toy models. Yes? One, one, one quick question. So when you draw this tensor network, are you thinking, so at each, where do the fermions act? Where do these F and F dagger act? Are uh, they acting now locally or are they? Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a great question. So um, so, uh, so the picture that I'm usually using where I, where I draw this is uh, this dual lettuce. Um, yes. This actually, this has a purpose. Uh, so if you, if you go, uh, go to this, um, the fermionic language is uh, Gaussian fermionic language. Essentially, your degrees of freedom are your, your operators, your creation operators in this picture, but you can generally think of them as operators in some Grassmann algebra. And they essentially live on these edges. They live on these, uh, they live on the connections between the tensors and the, uh, on the legs. Um, and the information that you're basically characterizing your states with is uh, how much uh, these, these edges, or the modes living on these edges are correlated with each other. Um, so there, there is a local picture of uh, in, in this, for these fermionic modes, but of course there's some uh, some subtlety of how this actually relates to a picture that would be local in spins. Um, so for now, uh, we just um, I mean that's that's a way you can describe say say happy cold states, but um, you can also think of just having a fermionic tensor network where the locality is just uh, defined in the, in the fermionic picture. But you're, you're saying that the Jordan Wigner, am I understanding this correctly, that you're saying that the Jordan Wigner transfer on these tensor networks will take the form of this nice duality of the lattice? Uh, so no, that's just on one, on one picture, you have a lattice with qubits on each side, and then you could take a dual lattice and put fermions on each link. Are you saying that this is the Jordan Wigner transfer? Well, it's, it's part it's part of the Jordan Wigner transfer. There's like, there are other, so there are other tricky parts that you have to worry about when you do that. In particular, there's an ordering of how you contract these tensors that you have to uh, keep in mind, which is not really included in this picture. And this this can this can lead to to problems. Um, 
but uh, I mean, for what's what I'm talking about uh, now, it you can just you can just think of having a tensor network that's defined in the fermionic language. You can also do that. Um, yeah, sure. Because a contraction and you can, it's just really a, it's it's a projection onto onto a Bell state, and you can also define a Bell state uh, uh, in fermionic language. Sure, sure. But this is now live on link. Uh, yes. So you, essentially, for the complexion, you can think of having a fermionic mode. Uh, so for each each connected each connected lattice, uh, for each connected uh, polygon, uh, you can think of as having one mode on the left, one mode on the right, and these modes both being projected onto some um, uh, onto some Bell state. Um, whereas the, the the free edges on the uh, on the, the border of this lattice uh, contain uh, like one one free physical fermionic mode, on which we define our state. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. No, there's actually a lot of subtlety in here um, that can uh, um, create problems, particularly if you uh, think about uh, entanglement measures of disjoint regions. Uh, then this map uh, from spins to fermions really uh, really changes a lot of things. Like, uh, so the, it's it's not it's not trivial to go from one, from one to the other. There's uh, there are subtleties. Um, okay, so now uh, what kind of geometries do you want to consider here? I mean, uh, again, we take the, the happy inspiration of regular tilings. Um, which is really the most, uh, the most symmetric uh, kind of lattice you can think of. And now, uh, very generically, you can think of having a flat tiling, uh, say, for example, a 3 6 tiling here with, uh, with triangles, or uh, you can have 3 7 tiling, which is hyperbolic, which is a, sort of a triangular version of this, uh, this geometry of the happy code that we were looking at previously. If you put just very generic magic gate tensors, very generic tensors fulfilling this constraint, um, and you compute uh, boundary correlation functions, you find that uh, gener for generic uh, parameters, the boundary correlation function on the boundary of a flat tiling will usually decay exponentially, uh, which makes sense because this, sort of this, the shortest cut uh, uh, through this bulk, if you think about it, will, will also be exponential. Uh, well, sorry, it will, be, will, be, will be linear. So if you, if, if you have an exponential decay along distance, you have an exponential decay on the boundary. Whereas for hyperbolic lattices, you will generally find a polynomial decay, which again makes sense because now you can take a, a logarithmic shortcut uh, through the bulk. Um, so generally, those people to behave very differently. However, there exists a, a very interesting critical point um, for flat tilings. Where even for flat tilings, um, the uh, boundary uh, correlations will also decay polynomially. Um, in terms of this critical point uh, for, for each individual tensor is uh, approximately similar to the critical point uh, in the hyperbolic lattice as well. So there exists a, a kind of tensor that you can put essentially both on a hyperbolic and a flat tiling. And it will give you um, uh, a boundary state uh, essentially with the same um, uh, uh, entanglement uh, and decay properties, which, which is a very curious result. So what, what does this mean? Uh, well, it, it means that uh, there exists a critical point in our, our tensor network space um, where uh, the boundary states are essentially independent of whether our bulk geometry is flat or hyperbolic. And that's essentially uh, an emergent while symmetry. Um, meaning that we can, uh, we, we, because we can always take a flat, uh, uh, a flat space or flat space time, and then uh, gradually rescale every, uh, layers of it to uh, until it looks hyperbolic. And this emergent vast symmetry is actually something um, that pre have previously found in um, uh, the imaginary time uh, parser table that you get uh, when you want to prepare a CFT state. Uh, so some of this is something that you would expect. If you if you look at uh, if you look at parser integrals in imaginary time, so the question immediately is, uh, arises: so is our tensor network a kind of parser integral? Um, and this uh, this question can actually be made made rigorous. And a very simple uh, way of doing that is, for example, by taking a continuum limit uh, uh, for flat for flat lattice, where you take essentially layers of these tensors uh, that you take you make them infinitely long, and you try to identify them with uh, an infinitesimal um, uh, time evolution step. Um, now, if you take infinitely many of these uh, infinitely long strips of, of tensors, you can uh, you can actually compute explicitly the continuum limit of that, and uh, your your fermionic modes uh, here essentially become become fields. Um, um, and in this, and so, so you can think of uh, the modes living on this side as of being some some field psi, on this side some field psi bar. So these are essentially your your creation annihilation operators in a, in a discrete algebra. And uh, so if you, if you take this continuum limit, what you end up with uh, is this pass integral. And this pass integral essentially uh, maps you from some initial state. Uh, for, for each initial state, it gives you, it gives you amplitudes for all possible final states. Um, 
So you can, you can do this rigorously. And now this, this pass integral here will, um, for, for, some, for some real uh, parameter Metzger tensor, um, will have some, um, uh, some, some, some Euclidean type um, uh, time evolution because, uh, well, there's no there's real parameters. There's no, uh, um, there's a cyclical behavior. There's no way to define an uh, uh, identity. But we should have called this, uh, this tau in here um, to match with uh, the notation here. Uh, so now if you, if you do this, you can actually, uh, in this limit, you can actually compute what this L, this factor of Lagrangian in this limit looks like. It turns out that if you are at this, this critical point um, that I uh, described e, uh, uh, previously, in the continuum limit, you actually get uh, the uh, uh, Lagrangian or Lagrangian density of a C equal one half uh, using CFT, so uh, uh, a free fermionic model, um, which I think is intuitively what you would also expect because, uh, I mean, this is a, a um, canonical uh, free fermionic uh, uh, CFT model. Okay, so now, so now we, we learned that somehow uh, these tensor networks uh, encode uh, uh, discretized, uh, discretized pass integrals. Um, now, of course, this continuum limit um, uh, only really works in, in, in flat, for flat uh, lattice. Um, if you have a hyperbolic lattice, uh, this uh, continuum limit is harder to do because we can't really, um, um, we can't really scale our tensors uh, infinitely, um, which means that, uh, for this, for this discrete uh, hyperbolic setting, um, we so far only have the intuition that somehow we would expect it to, to behave very similarly to this pass integral, but with some discrete artifacts. Um, and indeed, uh, I will now show you that we, uh, we can characterize what these artifacts are um, away from the continuum limit. Um, first of all, uh, just one more word about this critical scaling. Um, so we can now actually look at uh, the integument entropy in, this, in the scaling limit, and we exactly reproduce this, uh, this kind of with the Cardi formula with the flat and uh, hyperbolic tiling, and it gives you exactly what you would expect from the sequel one half uh, CFT limit in the continuum. So um, even in the discrete setting, you can see that uh, this, this all makes sense. And the only deviation really comes from some, some, uh, some finite size uh, effect uh, that you get uh, from your lattice. Okay, um, so uh, previously I said we would have a happy code. The happy code um, sort of had these like very sparse correlations. Now we have match gates, uh, which sort of give us more smooth correlations. So if we compare the correlation to OK, um, for, for the happy model, we get this, these very sparse uh, non-zero points, which correspond to these, uh, these diamond-like, these marijuana excitations. Um, and now we have, for these match gates, we can have a very smooth um, uh, um, easing-like decay of correlations. Um, same thing for the entanglement entropy. Um, so this one is already smooth for the happy code uh, because of this uh, uh, this uh, discrete uh, greedy wedge argument that I mentioned earlier. Um, however, uh, the, uh, the effective central charge, uh, the entanglement entropy growth for the happy code is much stronger than this, uh, this easing model that we have here, which uh, is just, of course, one central charge of one half. Um, so somehow, yeah, the happy code describes um, some high central charge model, but the correlation functions are, are, are very sparse. So one may speculate uh, whether this is uh, something that one might expect from uh, fixed area states in holography. Okay, so now, uh, as I said, we have, we have these match gates. Um, they describe uh, CFT-like states. Um, but can we actually uh, uh, go further and now do something that uh, would be impossible to do for this happy model, which is, can we define, uh, actually define like a proper uh, parent Hamlet for, for these states? I already showed you that, to you that in, this, uh, in the flat case, uh, we can do a continuum limit. We can have a, uh, a continuum uh, Lagrangian. So what can we do for the, for the hyperbolic setting, setting that uh, uh, we're really interested in? Um, so the problem here is, is really the following. Um, so we have a much tensor network right now, but we don't have uh, any, any bulk degrees of freedom. We just, we just have tensors and it will be, uh, everything in the bulk is contracted out and our only degrees of freedom live on the boundary. Um, and the boundary degrees of freedom we want to associate with a Hamiltonian, but we run into an issue here, which is that the, the boundary of, this, uh, of such a hyperbolic cut is not smooth, which means that uh, generally these tensor network states that we, uh, we get after, um, uh, well, constructing this tensor network, um, generally break translation invariance, um, which is bad because uh, a simple model uh, such as the, uh, the easing model at its critical point, uh, if we, if we do, do a very simple um, naive lattice um, uh, discretization of this model, we, we will get something translation invariant. And of course, translation invariance is also what we find as a continuum limit uh, of the CFT. 
Um, so now how do we go around this? Well, there's two possible solutions. Uh, one is we crank up the bottom dimension of our model um, until we have enough parameters to, to smooth out uh, this, uh, uh, this boundary um, uh, irregularity. The other solution is uh, we actually try to find a Hamiltonian, a boundary Hamiltonian, without translation invariance, uh, which, which is a parent Hamiltonian, which, whose ground state actually describes this ground state uh, that we get from the sensor network ansatz. Um, and uh, I'll focus here on the second part, um, which is to actually find a, find a parent Hamiltonian. And it turns out that these exist. Um, let's see how much time do I actually have left? Um, Let's see, uh, 20 minutes. So um, I think I'll, I'll say some more words about this construction just to make it more explicit. So now um, the, pro the, the, the main problem, as I said, is that if you take uh, cutoffs uh, these, these hyperbolic lattices, uh, they're not really smooth. Uh, they have some, some irregularity. But this irregularity can be, can be, can be quantified. Um, you can essentially think about, about uh, how the adjacency of your, uh, your edges in this, these lattices looks like. And you can uh, grow them by some um, uh, specific procedures. And uh, previously in 2019, uh, people found that actually uh, these, uh, this irregularity uh, has, uh, has a certain symmetric structure, which is uh, um, that of uh, quasi-periodicity. So you will actually find uh, recurring uh, symmetry features uh, on this boundary, which in some way is like a, a discrete version of, uh, of self-similarity, because uh, you find the same sequences appearing again and again, and again on, each, uh, on each length scale. So here I've, I've color coded them to show a different kind of, uh, of edges with different kind of adjacency. The details here are not very important. Uh, the main point is that you can, uh, you can quantify how this, uh, how this uh, irregularity behaves as you go your tensor network. Uh, and now if you look at two point correlation functions, uh, of course, these are not smooth either. Um, so uh, we look at here at this covariance matrix, which is this canonical object that we uh, look at when talking about free fermionic states, which is just the two point, um, Function of my, my runner operators, um, which uh, I denote as uh, a small gamma here, um, and so generic two-point function will have this uh, this very non-translation variant structure, uh, which looks a bit like a, like a tartan pattern. Uh, but it turns out that there exists a map uh, from uh, these uh, uh, from this disordered uh, these disordered covariance matrices to uh, to smooth covariance matrix or approximately smooth metric uh, covariance matrix up to uh, Small scale deviations, uh, and it turns out that this, uh, this disorder can be entirely captured uh, by some some disorder vector that I just call G, uh, where we uh, perform the map uh, according to, to this formula. Um, so now, of course, capturing uh, this this disorder in like a like a, a single object doesn't really mean that uh, we can construct a Hamiltonian a priori, but uh, we actually showed that. Uh, for a certain, certain type of disorders that are actually fulfilled in this example, you can actually map from these disordered states uh, to a disordered Hamiltonian. So what you do is, instead of having a Hamiltonian like this, where you have a translation variant model, um, this is the, what the naive uh, easing like uh, Hamiltonian as a critical point would look like. You have a coupling between nearest neighbor Majorana modes and the coupling is the same in every side. So instead of that, what we do is uh, we add a, a disorder term to each of these, uh, these coupling terms. So more disordered easing model. Um, and this disorder uh, uh, is exactly the disorder that we, we find in this covariance matrix. And we can actually prove uh, that uh, for uh, states that have the disorder of this, of this structure, um, uh, this parent Hamiltonian actually is, uh, um, uh, the ground state of this parent Hamiltonian is exactly this, uh, well, is, 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 corresponds to that state that we get from the sensor network ansatz. Uh, up to deviations at a, at a scale which is um, um, determined uh, by this disorder and which essentially is a, uh, is a letter scale in this example. So what we uh, do without going into too many technical details here is uh, we have a tensor network. Um, tensor network has a two-point correlation function which uh, is encoded in this covariance matrix. This covariance matrix has a disorder form which we encode in this disorder vector. And from the disorder vector, we can construct a parent Hamiltonian. Um, which to a very uh, good approximation uh, is a Hamiltonian whose ground state is that state that our tensor network produces. Okay, so there's also an analytical ansatz how to get these, these disorder vectors from uh, the geometry uh, of, these, of these lattices, uh, uh, which we call like multi-scale quasi-crystal ansatz. If you want, you can read more about this in our, in our paper from last year, 
uh, but uh, yeah, this is just a, a, a I think goes too far down down the rabbit hole. Um, uh, in any case, so let's uh, uh, let's go, go with the upshot of this. So um, what we have now is a Hamiltonian, a boundary Hamiltonian, uh, which I denote like this, uh, for this uh, three seven match gauge uh, tensor network. So I have this tensor network, and a hyperbolic tiling, which we somehow expect uh, to to be some to, cre to create like an easing easing like segment boundary. We make this more concrete by giving it a Hamiltonian that exactly is the easing model up to some disorder. Um, and now we, did, we, did, we describe this ground state. Now, can we go beyond ground states? Now, obviously we have a Hamiltonian. Yeah, Hamiltonian has an entire spectrum. Um, now, does, first of all, the question might be, is this, does the spectrum have any similarity with this uh, translation variant easing model that we actually want to describe in the first place? And it turns out that uh, actually the low energy um, um, spectrum of this, uh, of this discrete Hamiltonian, of this ordered Hamiltonian, exactly matches this translation invariant case. So what uh, this really means is that uh, this weird disorder that we get from, from this discrete uh, tensor network setting really doesn't matter. We really have the same underlying theory. We have an easing-like theory. And the only deviation that we get from this uh, translation invariant model um, happen essentially at, um, um, at, some, uh, at, at some large distances where we, where we really uh, sort of, where, where, the, where the quantum, quantum system that we, we create using this tensor network ansatz Sort of feels the, the finiteness of our, of our of tensor network. So we have a we have a Hamiltonian that, as you can see, is an uh, overlapping spectrum. It essentially, behaves like the easing model. Um, but of course, so far, what I've uh, what I've done is just given you a tensor network that creates the, the ground state, where essentially all of these these eigen modes are, um, are set to zero. Um, so the question is, uh, can we uh, can we create excitations, which is really what we're interested in in holography? We want to do dynamics. We want to create excited states. So can we add bulk degrees of freedom? Um, and this is really where things get interesting. Um, OK, so let me first say what, what our final goal is before I go into uh, what we've actually constructed. Um, so our final goal, as I said, is to construct a code, like we did for the happy code, between bulk and boundary degrees of freedom. So we, we want to have something like here, like a hyperbolic uh, triangular tiling. Well, on each tensor in the bulk, each, 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 each triangle, we have some bulk degree of freedom, some bulk leg. And we want to, uh, to have a map to boundary degrees of freedom, boundary legs, which I've, I've drawn here in blue. Um, and we want this to be a code. Um, but what, we've, what we've done so far is we just really have only constructed a code where each of these bulk legs is, is projected out to some, um, some say, logical zero state, some logical ground state. So all that we have so far is uh, a, very, uh, a very simple code, a code for a single state. Which essentially maps uh, uh, sort of a logical zero state everywhere in the bulk in a, in, a, in a product state to a single state on the boundary, which is our our ground state, uh, according to this uh, Hamiltonian uh, that we just constructed. So this is not really a very good photographic code, um, and you would want to uh, be able to describe more than just one one state, one ground state. Um, and how do you do that? Well. Um, the simplest way to do this would be to add a logical qubit uh, to your central tile. Let's, let's keep all the other, other one fixed for now. Let's just uh, try to uh, actually make one of these sides dynamical. Um, so I've uh, tried to visualize this here by um, sort of drawing legs everywhere. So these blue dots, we have a, a projection onto the, this logical zero state, which is sort of our bulk ground state. And now um, let's, uh, let's take a central tile, central triangle, and project a, a logical one state. Uh, onto it, and now what we want to have, what we would want to have, what we would like to have, is a um, boundary map that, that looks like looks like that. So a map where we still have a uh, logical uh, zero state on all of these other uh, all these other triangles and all of these other tiles, um, and have one qubit which uh, has some superposition of uh, logical zero and logical one uh, on this tile, um, mapped to some superposition of some ground state and some excited state on the boundary. Um, now, does this map actually work? Can, can we actually do that? Um, and well, actually, for this uh, tensor network that I was giving you, this V7 Magica tensor network, the critical point, uh, the answer is actually yes. Um, and uh, we can see this by ex explicitly tuning uh, our tensor parameters. So we, uh, we take uh, our tensors um, um, on, on each tile. We um, modify the, uh, the tensor only in the center. 
uh, parameterizes here by some some simple parameter a naught. And if we look at what boundaries that we get uh, with respect to uh, to our parent Hamiltonian, and uh, so this is a potential projection onto the uh, to the lowest uh, energy eigenmode of this of this parent Hamiltonian. Um, and so this this point over here would be the uh, the ground state where we have uh, zero zero everywhere. And as we tune through this uh, through this match gate space, uh, we can see that we can uh, we actually create excited states. We can go all the way to the uh, to the first excited states where uh, essentially all um, all higher uh, energy modes are, are the same, and the lower energy mode is excited. So if you think about going to the uh, the eigenspace uh, decomposition of your your parent Hamiltonian, uh, you, can, you, know, you can think of the ground state as being your Fermi C, uh, where the uh, uh, where all of your um, um, all of your negative modes are occupied and your positive modes are unoccupied, and uh, so the first excited state in that picture would be to uh, go from the uh, lowest energy uh, mode and uh, switch that state uh, from from um, and switch the excited and uh, non-excited state. This is exactly the excitation that we are we're tuning here. Now, um, what was uh, exciting here in pairs? Um, uh, one reason is because we have uh, fermionic parity constraints that we're essentially only working with par parity even states. Um, but actually, this is something we would uh, like to do anyways, because uh, what we essentially have here in the spectrum are, are left and right moving modes. And uh, uh, so far, we're just looking at a uh, superposition of those, so we don't have to worry about uh, uh, chirality. OK, so we can actually excite these states. Um, and which, what that essentially means is that we can, that within this match gate subspace, uh, we can construct uh, basis states for a logical qubit uh, on one of these on one of these tiles, one of these tensors. Um, and what this means is that we can use a match gate state to construct um, uh, to construct a code. And this code is very very strange uh, because uh, this logical code that we've now constructed is not built in the way that a happy code is built, where each individual tensor uh, defines your isometry. So I've, I've tried to visualize this here. So if you just take each individual tensor. Um, so this, uh, this actually tends on the on the central qubit, on uh, the central uh, triangle. It has a the bulk leg that we've now been able to construct using this uh, this uh, basis, this match gate basis. <clears throat> but if we take the two uh, two basis states, where one is a uh, logical zero state, which is over here, the logical one state, which is over here, which uh, we've uh, which I've uh, denoted with a red dot over here, uh, these two states uh, for a single uh, single triangle are actually not orthogonal. But as we uh, embed uh, this tensor with a bulk leg into this uh, into this larger tensor network, um, which uh, for the uh, logical zero states uh, projected in, we can think of as a pass integral, as I said earlier. Um, as we do that, uh, asymptotically, uh, the, the two states that we produce here uh, uh, from, e from each bulk input do become um, orthogonal to one another. And so this, this map here, uh, where we have a bulk leg coming, uh, going in here, becomes approximately isometric as the tensor network uh, becomes large. So this is a very different kind of code uh, than the code we had previously from the happy code, um, is that it really requires a sort of a, a layer of tensors without, uh, um, without bulk qubits in some sense to, um, to, to, be, to be isometric. Um, and uh, so the resolution of this paradox uh, is that uh, this, uh, these tensors here are really, really uh, as I said previously, a sort of imaginary time pass integral. And uh, we can intuitively think of this uh, as creating an exponential separation between uh, asymptotic energy eigenstates. Because what this pass integral really, really does is it uh, sort of cools you ground, down to the ground state. And, uh, um, and each, each excited state uh, um, essentially becomes exponentially separated from, from from, from any other state. Um, so that is why we, we need this layer of tensors uh, to produce this, this, this asymptotic code. Um, and uh, now, obviously, this was a very simple model where we just have uh, well, one logical qubit at the center. And uh, for, for an actual like interesting code, we would want to have multiple bulk qubits. Can we do that? Um, and uh, this is, uh, Generally, of course, difficult to uh, to study numerically because uh, for if we, as soon as we add a, a bulk like here, we have superpositions over match gate states. Uh, we uh, we have a tensor that may be non match gate, but uh, even within this match gate constraint, we find that uh, there are actually these low lying excited states. 
So what I've drawn here is uh, essentially a color-coded uh, match gate input for each of the triangles for a small system. Um, and I've shown you bulk configurations of this match gate input that correspond to excited states on the boundaries, low-lying excited states. So this here is a, is a ground state where each tensor has the same input, um, call it E naught. The first excited state, second one, third, fourth excited states. And as we see, um, we have to uh, modify tensors that are further and further apart um, from the center of this network uh, to create higher energies. So there's a uh, somehow an uh, emergent relationship between uh, radial size of the sensor network and, uh, and boundary energy scale. And I've shown you here in brackets the fidelity uh, of the state that we produce using this ansatz and the actual actual excited state of this uh, of this boundary Hamiltonian. As you see, the fidelity is really good for these uh, these first excited states, but then starts dropping off. And this is not uh, unexpected because really this code picture, what we would expect is that uh, these, uh, these higher excited states uh, uh, could lie anywhere without this match gate ansatz because we would uh, we might have all sorts of superpositions uh, in our bulk qubits. Um, in other words, the match gate condition breaks as we, uh, as we approach high energies. And we would really want to uh, extend this to a full code where we have uh, logical bulk qubits essentially everywhere. And so constructing this, uh, uh, this generic code really becomes uh, now the, the interesting challenge uh, uh, at this point. Okay, um, yeah, so um, I've, uh, uh, I think I've, um, I'm running out of time anyway, so it's good that I've come to the conclusion of my talk. <laughs> um, so let me give you a summary of uh, what I talked about. Um, um, so first of all, I talked about tensor networks. I, I hope I convinced you that tensor networks capture various aspects of holography. Um, but uh, the challenge is really to create tensor networks that uh, combine all of these different aspects in one model, in particular that combine um, uh, descriptions of conformal field theory states or CFT-like states, while also implementing some sort of quantum error correcting code. Um, now I've introduced these magical tensor networks uh, that describe uh, essentially free fermionic states. Uh, now they're great because they're very efficiently contractible, so you can uh, uh, if you build large tensor networks uh, on your uh, on your home laptop, uh, that's of course great for exploring potential toy models, uh, including as we've seen toy models for holography. And we put an explicit construction where, um, where the boundary states of our hyperbolic tilings of these magical tensor networks uh, correspond to some disordered critical easing model. Um, and we even see that there's an emergent low energy dictionary where we can associate uh, bulk configurations in these magical tensor networks to low energy excited states of the Hamiltonian. Um, now, there are obviously a lot of uh, further uh, uh, directions that this can go and a lot of questions that remain. Uh, the first one uh, being what I already mentioned, that uh, uh, we really want to have an explicit construction uh, format which contains several bulk qubits, uh, where perhaps we can use symmetries um, to uh, make our work simpler by uh, essentially requiring that if we have a large tensor network, we would expect that uh, the, the, the bulk qubit structure on each uh, individual uh, a tile uh, looks similar. So maybe it is really sufficient to generalize just one logical bulk qubit to uh, create a multi qubit uh, bulk Hilbert space. Um, then once we have such a construction, of course, what we want to do is we want to simulate bulk time dynamics uh, by starting from this boundary um, time evolution that we now understand where we have a Hamiltonian. And of course, the question is, if we match this boundary time evolution to some bulk time evolution on these bulk degrees of freedom, do we get something like tensor network gravity do we see excitations in the bulk? Uh, I don't know, falling, falling in the bulk, or something like that. Like, what, what would be the dual uh, uh, picture of uh, of this of this boundary uh, easing evolution? Uh, and uh, what does it even mean in ADS CFT? Because obviously, uh, if you talk about something like the easing model in ADS CFT, uh, it's not really a um, a large and strongly coupled uh, CFT model. So, some of our ADS CFT we would expect this, this bulk gravity is not really uh, a uh, very nice, uh, smooth Einstein gravity like theory. Um, I haven't really talked about the structure of entanglement wedges in these tensor networks. Uh, there's a way you can, uh, you can define them as well. And they're kind of similar, but not, they don't have this uh, exact sharp structure that uh, we know from the happy code. Um, the connection to path integrals that I was talking about earlier um, would be very interesting to make that more rigorous because uh, obviously what I've, uh, what I've told you so far was a bit hand wavy. Um, and it only really works well for, uh, for flat tilings. Um, and finally, uh, of course, to really go to the uh, canonical ADS-CFT regime, 
we would want to understand large bond dimensions. We would want to understand uh, letter CFT at high central charge. But there, of course, we uh, enter a regime of interacting models where uh, even working with tensor networks can be very computationally demanding. All right, um, that's it for my talk. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, um, so most of this talk is uh, based on uh, results uh, from this recent paper we've uh, recently published in JHAP, which is joint work with Marek Luser, Charlotte Verhoeven, uh, Supinder Singh, and Jens Eisert. And uh, my uh, work has been supported by uh, these uh, various organizations. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for the talk, Alex. Uh, are there questions for Alex? So I, I do have one one thing. I just want to make sure I understand this mapping uh, that you're, you're talking about. So you take a vertex, mm -hmm. right? And let's say there are um, a bunch of legs coming out of it, mm -hmm. right? So you draw the dual lattice, which would be a polygon, right? Mm -hmm. And you, so basically you replace the tensor on that vertex with, R or whatever we call it, different fermions that act on the links of this polygon. Yes. Why is this a, I mean, why is this a good map? <laughs> I mean, I'm missing the intuition. Ah, why I mean, so, ah, I mean what, what we have before is that, uh, I mean, we have the spin degrees of freedom that live on your, on your edges, right? We have, uh, say, your, your poly operators, which, which you can act. If you think about it in like an algebraic way. Um, and now we're just replacing these, this poly algebra with a, with a fermionic algebra. So this, I mean, in some, some way, the degrees of freedom, your algebra degrees of freedom already lived before on these edges. So, um, so these, are, these are like Majorana fermions. So they're like, I should be thinking of two of them as a pair of them as a qubit. Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, two Majoranas, or you can just think of a single physical fermionic mode. Um, so uh, this, uh, the way I've written down it, uh, I just use creation operators. Um, go back to oh, ah, this, the, I think the slide. The, the um, fact that the, the, the fact that the uh, oh I see. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. <laughs> I see. All right. Any other any other questions? I do have actually one more question, but I mean, as long as you were talking about these fermionic systems, maybe you said this, but you are sort of always limited to this, these Gaussian states, right? Ah, yes. Yeah, so so the, for the Gaussian states, things become much easier because we can essentially use these uh, results for efficient uh, contraction of tensors. Um, as soon as we use more complicated states, uh, the contraction becomes uh, well very potentially you know, exponentially hard. Um, but, but um, do, we, do we really think that the, the description that's relevant for a complex system like holography involves a set of Gaussian states? Yeah, that's the thing. So, I mean, uh, so obviously in uh, like the full, full ADS CFT, we don't really think of the boundary state. Or if, if we think about states of, of, a, of a CFT um, as being something strongly interacting, no. So um, we would think of, uh, um, so, say, say the canonical ADL CFT limit is something where you have, um, uh, where, where they say, 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 free fermion uh, and that uh, doesn't really work. Um, but I mean, what we're doing here really is that we're only using the, um, this match kit as a, as a basis. So, it's really only the basis states of our, um, um, of our bulk Hilbert space, so to speak. So, uh, for example, for the happy code, which, uh, so for a happy code, for example, um, if you have any uh, arbitrary uh, uh, bulk input, so you think of some some state in the bulk, uh, or you think of just some product state, um, which does not consist of just basis states, but you say you have bell pairs everywhere. And the state that you produce on the boundary will be uh, a very, very non-Gaussian state. Uh, if you want to describe a, yes. a parent Hamiltonian, you know, it would be, uh, 
or you could probably have something that's just a Gaussian, but it would be something very non-local. So it would yeah. not would not not fit naturally into the description of of uh, of, a, of a non-interacting state. So um, uh, the uh, the Gaussianity only comes uh, into play uh, essentially through our choice of basis. Ah, I see. And so for the mesh case, it's kind of the same thing now that we we, we choose a, essentially a basis where there's a logical. Uh, uh, I think I have actually have a picture of that. Whereas the product state of, uh, of logical zeros in the bulk. Um, I guess this one, but the, uh, the product state of logical zero states in the bulk is mapped to some, some free fermionic state. So we would think of, uh, yeah, excited, so we would think of excited states uh, in this model to be generally mapped to something, uh, something that has a bulk description, which is actually much more complicated. But even the, the fact, yeah, I mean, the bulk vacuum is super simple, right? It's just like a free field theory on uh, some sort of a curved background, ADS background. But on the boundary, you get the vacuum of a strongly coupled theory in ADS CFD, right? right, right. So the vacuum state on the boundary is pretty complex, right? Whereas here, this E naught vector has a very simple structure, right? Yeah, it's sometimes the other way around. No? I mean, uh... Somehow we would expect that the bulk description becomes more complicated as you go to uh, high energy states. But we'll, let's just talk vacuum. You know, don't we expect that in the vacuum? Even, even the vacuum yeah. like the, of, the, of the boundary theory for strong couple CFP is complex, right? It's not like that. Right. right. I see. All right. OK, thanks. Um, any, any last questions? If not, let's. Thank Alex again for the wonderful talk. And uh, hopefully soon there will be an opportunity that you could come visit us in person. Looking that would be great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you again thank for you. inviting me. Bye guys.